Let's call a meeting to order and stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Mr. Brennan. Honorable Mayor Ron Shaver. Here. Council Member Dan Marler. Here. Christine Casto. Here. Allison Howe. Uh, she has not shown up as of yet. Clint Anderson. Here. Lisa Northrup. Here. Kevin Lindell. Here. Okay, first on the agenda is approval of the minutes from our December 19, 2017 regular meeting. Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Your Honor. A copy of those minutes is uh, provided in your packet and is presented for your approval by resolution. Has everybody reviewed them? Any corrections, revisions? I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution accepting the minutes from the December 19th, 2017 City Council regular meeting. Second. I have a resolution by Christine Castell, a second by Lisa Northrup. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries on a unanimous vote of six to zero with council member Howe absent. Next, we have an update on the <coughs> Youth Advisory Council. Mr. Wells and Mr. Hamer. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, while Ty makes his way up here, just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Uh, council last year asked that we put in the budget and consider uh, a program that would get more youth involved in the government process here at the city. And so Ty and I have spent some time together looking at uh, other um, programs and other communities and talked about what might work best for the city of Fort Morgan. We have an outline. I'll let him present that on kind of what we're thinking. And if council's okay with this, then we'll proceed. So take it away, Ty. Um, well, hopefully you got this in your packet, but um, our ideas are relatively simple um, to put together a, um, a city-sponsored program through the high school. Uh, they'd be involved with five students, um, a high school representative, a city representative, and a council representative. Um, ultimately, their goal would to be have a project, plan it, brainstorm, present to council. Um, they would be required to attend a meeting a month, um, one council meeting a month. We'd have a meeting a month um, and essentially go from there. When Jeff brought the idea to me, we were already talking about putting together a group of kids to help finish the BMX track where the skateboard park is. So um, that's kind of the idea with the project, something that would help the community, um, help the kids learn and grow. And then each semester, hopefully the kids would be rewarded by a field trip to um, the Colorado Municipal League or to visit the Capitol building, something like that. So, um, we're thinking Greg Edson is the guy to contact at the school. Um, I kind of reached out to him already via email. Haven't heard back because he's on vacation. But um, hopefully we can organize with the school and turn it into a, a credit deal where the students that participate might earn some credits for school. Any questions? Yeah, I, I, I have a little bit of a concern with going with the Fort Morgan High School students. We have several youth in, that live in the city who maybe attend Brush or attend online school, sure. who attend uh, Prairie School, and it seems like this would exclude them from participating. Right. Well, and, and now that you mentioned that, I same deal. My son's got friends that go to school in Weldona all over the place, so um, maybe the approach is more to talk to the actual school district um, and go that route instead of just the high school. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of that. Well, good point. I make it open to kids that live in the city of Fort Morgan. Right, is what live you're in the city as opposed to kids associated with a school or a school district. Right, good point. I think we can figure that out for sure. Okay, and, and I think what we'll do is um, we can talk with the high school and figure out how they could get the kids involved but then also if we open it up and they apply and maybe one of those things where if they go to Weldona or Wiggins or Brush that um, you know the 
high school representative here could talk to the school there and see if there's something that we can do to make them work together. You know, one of the thoughts that we had was we could uh, uh, do these me meetings over lunchtime maybe uh, and provide lunch to the kids and, and the members of the organization. But obviously if, if we've got people from other school districts trying to coordinate, that might be a little bit difficult. So I think we need to take that into consideration and make it open for kids within the community and figure out how we can work all of this into one program. But I think that's a really good suggestion. So would this be just for the kids in the school or, uh, pardon me, the uh, live, reside within the city or in yeah. the school because there's county in that? that I, I think the idea that we had was Fort Morgan residents go on to Fort Morgan High School. We didn't take into consideration there may be Fort Morgan residents that go to different high school, but we'd want them to be a resident of the city of Fort Morgan, I think, to be a part of that, unless you want to expand that out. I guess I'd be open. Or we're open to whatever you want. I think residency in the city is important, but I don't, I don't know that attendance at a particular school is important. Mm, I kind of disagree with that. I mean, we are the city of Fort Morgan that works with the Fort Morgan School District, and you know, if they citizens live in the city of Fort Morgan and choose to go to another school district, that's their choice. Sometimes those choices have consequences, and you don't get all the benefits. Well, that is their choice. However, um, they have worked here in the city. They live here in the city. Their parents are paying taxes here in the city. Uh, they're shopping. They're buying stuff here in the city. They are a part of the community. And because they choose to attend school in another location, shouldn't exclude them from participating in a city program. So I, if it's going to be a credited or get credit for this class, it does state in your the objectives for local and state government to give them exposure to it. <coughs> so would you just include to me, you would include anybody in the high school well, and, system. And, and on all our other boards and commissions, we do have a provision to have people who live in the county, the county to be a part of those boards and commissions. So it wouldn't be outside of the realm that you would you know, be outside of the city of Fort Morgan. But I don't know if we would want somebody who lives in Brush and goes to Brush High School to necessarily be on the city of Fort Morgan Youth Council. Um, that, that may not meet kind of the overarching we, we may not even be able to organize it where it's a credit earning no. situation i mean i haven't talked to ben or anybody yet that was just a thought process i i agree with all of you i mean everybody in the county recreates in fort morgan in the city of fort morgan so i mean i don't know how you differentiate between one or the other but. Well, and i think it's really important um I, I tend to lean towards what Clint is saying. I think it's, you know, it's, it's key that we're involving with our high school. I would want to make sure we're not excluding the, the homeschool kids. There's a very large homeschool alliance of citizens that live in the city of Fort Morgan and the kids are educated. But I think it's important because they may not have that exposure because they're, you know, doing a homeschool project. So I would hope we could try to work a little bit with that. and. I, I think ultimately we have to see what the interest is. We may right. find that we don't have five Fort Morgan High School kids that are interested. So you may have to open it a little bit more. And I think maybe what you do is you give preferential treatment to a Fort Morgan resident student well, and no. then branch it out from there each semester if there's openings. Right, I think we need a starting point. We need somewhere to get off the ground. And I mean, I think the keep it simple, stupid idea. You know, we don't want to overthink this. I would talk to some of the teachers, the administration at the school and and see where it takes us. Um, I guess tonight we're just hoping to get some input from you guys and, and see if this is the direction that council was looking for. Um, and, and you can't really open it up to homeschool, but then close it off to the Weldona student. But you can if there are homeschool students who live in the city of Fort Morgan. Yeah, but if you're a resident of the city of Fort Morgan and you're choosing not to go to Fort oh, Morgan okay. High School. I see what you're saying. 
I mean, and if you're a resident there, there, of the, he's right. There is a resident. fair number of kids that live here and go somewhere. Else. Yeah. Well, Especially like Prairie and stuff. And I think, you know, what I'm getting from council in the direction that we want to go is to be as inclusive as we possibly can, because we want to have kids uh, participate in this. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to limit it and then not have the right number of kids to, to be involved. Um, obviously, when we, we create and structure the, the program, we want to be mindful and thoughtful of, of the partners and everything that goes into this. So, I, I, yeah, but I think inclusivity is really the point of this, not exclusivity, is to have as many kids involved as possible. So you're looking at this being a starting sometime in the fall semester? Mm -hmm. I, so you got yeah. some time to work this out? And right, and I think that's the concept that we, if this is kind of the direction you want us to go, this wouldn't be the final program, but we'd start working with the high school and kind of get their feedback and there's like because they may say they don't want to have anything to do with it we don't know at this point i know i talked to greg Edson a little bit and i know <laughs> ty's followed up with them that they they were interested in doing something like that with the uh, government and social studies classes so uh, we did have some interest from fort morgan high school to start this program so um you know we're just trying to make sure we're heading down the right path and we can include in our discussions you know, inclusivity of people that maybe be in homeschool or live in Fort Morgan and go to uh, different schools uh, in the county. I really think that this could be the start of, I don't know, a bigger picture arrangement with the school or the high school or all the schools to help recruit kids to volunteer time at the library with the rec center. I mean, we need referees, we need a lot of help and it seems like I don't know what the word is but the, the people are there we just need to somehow learn to work with these kids and help mentor them into these roles for our community um, and letting I, I really am surprised there's not more youth volunteer at the library and other places where we might if we can get in touch with Clint and Harrison Chisholm and Greg Edson and try to work on some of these programs I think we could create a lot of interest in not only programming that we're doing through the rec center and other places but potential employees for the future well and let the kids be the voice right. because kids are going to listen to kids more than they're right. going to listen to well and, administration. And, and start to give them some pride and ownership right. in different things along uh, you know along the way like the bmx track if i can get a group of kids to help us build a bmx track they have a feeling of ownership in that you know rather than just closing it and then opening it a month later with a new track. I like it. So I guess what I'm hearing is there is support to move forward with this. Yep. Kevin? Sounds like a good idea to me. I, I, as I was sitting here listening to it, I was kind of thinking, you know, the pros and cons of limiting it to the high school, you know, especially where you're going to have uh, a faculty member from the high school. and trying to get but trying to make sure you get input from different kids and I think that probably the big thing is uh, I mean, diversity of input is one thing but I think true interest and dedication to the prospect is probably the thing that you know I think would be the big driver as far as selection you know trying to find kids that are actually going to be dedicated to it and put their time into it mm -hmm. and really work to try and make sure that as uh, the city we get the input then of these uh, younger teenagers and everything as to what they want in the city and where they'd like to see it go and like we talked about initially when we did this what potentially would prompt them to want to stay in uh, the city after they graduate what? well um, <clears throat> I'm always going to be in favor of the Fort Morgan School District um, why is that <laughs> <laughs> And so anything we can do to partner with the city, uh, I'm for. Uh, there are a lot of good programs that are in the works, I know, with the city and school. And so anything we can do to continue that. Also, just engaging uh, a faculty member uh, along with those FMHS students. Uh, I have no problem opening up if we can't find some, but I would prefer first right to Fort Morgan High School. I think, or, I think the starting point is the high school. I mean, that's... The people that will be able to help us organize and get off the ground are at the high school. Or with Lincoln High School as well as a school district. Dan? 
there are a lot of good kids who don't go to Fort Morgan High School who would love to participate in something like this, who live in the city, who would be a great asset and be able to contribute. They may be willing to get release time in order to drive to Fort Morgan High School for a lunch meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't want to exclude those students just because right. we have a greater love for Fort Morgan High School. I think we need to allow all of our youth who live in the city of Fort Morgan an opportunity, whether they accept it or not, they <coughs> ought to have the opportunity to participate. But I'm sure there's a way to figure it out. So I, I think we're gonna try and make sure that, the, that we're in, as inclusive as possible in the process. But we'll be, this will be coming back to council as we move through the process to see what support we have at different levels. And, and we, there's gonna be, there will be adjustments to what our initial plan is but at this point. You have until fall to yep. get her lined out. So sounds like go ahead and proceed with what you got. And you got a little bit of work cut out for you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ty. Thanks. And thank you for your input, council. Yeah. That's helpful. That's fine. Next, we have a presentation and possible action on bids for GIS Consulting uh -huh. Services. Mr. Brent Nation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, what I brought tonight, and we kind of drew straws on who should be bringing this, it's the GIS department is kind of becoming, there's three of us, I think, that are the main players in it right now. It's Nelson, who's overseeing the department, myself through the utilities, and then Steve through public service. Um, as we've moved forward with our new employee in the department, he is phenomenal, and what he's doing for us right now is helping us out and moving us in that direction. We've noticed right away, though, that in order to get a lot of our utility stuff up to speed a little bit quicker so we aren't delayed in being able to fully utilize what we're going to have, um, we really could use an outside consultant to help put some of the additional components together, the data tables and things like that. So Pat is working with Nelson on what data to put in there, and then we'd like to be able to use an outside consultant to go ahead and help compile the stuff that's going in there. And as we've had these discussions, we've just realized that this may be an ongoing thing as we find stuff within the, the GIS software that we may want to bring somebody in that's got a little more expertise in working with the, the QGIS that we've decided to go with and some of that. And so this isn't a knock on Nelson, it's not a knock on and Pat in the department, but it's just wanting to bring somebody on that we can rely upon and not have to necessarily go out to bid for every little component that we want to bring into the GIS. And so we basically um, opened up for consulting services to see who um, was interested, um, receive a lot of emails um, companies from all over the United States actually sent us questions and everything about this. It was interesting once we opened it up, just how many companies um, showed some interest. Uh, we did get four companies that submitted proposals to us, um, a couple in Colorado and then one all the way out in Virginia. Um, we, would, we would like to go ahead and, and utilize the um, adaptive resources company that's here local. They helped us kind of get the software up and going and are very familiar with our system already. Um, they are local, so when we need somebody to come over and look at something, they're there. Some of these other companies wanted to know if they could you know, do their entire contract over the phone and not actually come to Fort Morgan. <laughs> and that right there, I didn't think would work in this case. So. So it's uh, my recommendation that we go ahead and enter into just a services agreement with um, Adaptive Resources. This is the same company that we use for, they specialize not only in GIS, but they do water consulting. This is who we use for our augmentation plan um, consulting too. So we, we have a working relationship with the company already. So I'm looking for approval to enter into a, a services contract with them to help us with our GIS work. So once we have all of our GIS up and and going, which pretty phenomenal job or undertaking, uh, this will kind of go towards what we have as our on-call concrete and yes. on-call yeah. services. We need something. If Pat done. gets into a situation where we ask him to prepare something, something. for a project and he just no. isn't quite capable of doing it, 
we'll be able to just have them call adaptive resources and have a conversation with their GIS person and he can walk them through it and help us at any given time. And so, good idea, good plan. It's always good when we can use local. Absolutely. There's no questions or is that a print? I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution approving the mayor to sign a services agreement with Adaptive Resources Incorporated for GIS consulting services for the city of Fort Morgan. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup <clears throat> and a second by Christine Castell. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brent. Brent, next we have a presentation and possible action on a resolution approving the extension of our firm power agreement with Western Area Power Administration and authorizing the mayor to sign the agreement. Yes, um, I was in council two years ago, three years ago now, um, to talk about this the first time. City of Fort Morgan receives we receive power from two different parts of WAPA, basically. Um, and it depends on which part of their system we're receiving our power through. Um, a couple years ago, I brought an extension of the contract for the, the LAP side of that. That's the Loveland area projects. And that's basically the water that comes down through the CBT system, into the Missouri Basin, and everything that's on the east side of the um, Continental Divide. And so we receive part of our WAPA allotment through that system, but then we also receive some of our power that is generated through the basically the Colorado River um, system. And that's run out of the Salt Lake office, and so it gets a Salt Lake designation, and so everybody in the business refers to it as your SLICA allotment. So you have LAP and SLICA. We've already approved extensions to the LAP. <coughs> Tonight, I'm back in front of you with a request to extend the SLICA portion of our contract. <laughs> um, our current contract isn't up until September of 2024. Um, the whole reason that this didn't get in front of you a couple of years ago with the LAP contract was they were still waiting on some potential litigation on the Colorado River. And so they didn't want to re renew anybody's contracts until the federal government knew they, where they were with those discussions that's all been resolved or at least it's far enough along that they feel they can extend these contracts so um, the contract extension as you can see um, basically gets us out into the oh 2057 yeah 2057 oh, I was looking for that number this is a <laughs> this is a long-term extension of, like of power but when it comes down to it WAPA is our cheapest power that we get I pulled numbers from our last bills and should I wait for it to sit or? No, let's keep going. Carry just keep going. Just keep going. Or, okay, no, just keep, keep going. going. Um, so, yeah, I pulled our November bills just to show you a comparison of what we pay WAPA and what we pay mean for the rest of our electricity. So, in November, our WAPA charges were basically 1.2 cents per kilowatt hour, where our mean energy rate is 4.1 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, it's very cheap, affordable power. Everybody in the power market, when you tell them how large of a WAPA allotment we have is very jealous of the city of Fort Morgan. That is one of the things that we're very fortunate. It's probably the primary reason we have the lowest rates that we do in the state is because of the amount of that allocation. So it's my opinion, Jeff's opinion, everybody's opinion on staff that this is the type of contract extension that we would definitely want to approve and do. Uh, we do apologize we didn't submit the entire package to you in your electronic thing because there's like a hundred pages of history that goes to the contract that doesn't have any relevance to what was in the first 37 pages. So well, I'm, I'm disappointed because that was a very captivating 37 pages. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next 37 were even, yeah, snoozers. You, you, you can happily provide it to him afterwards. Yes, I'd be happy to get your copy down. And he can synopsize it for the rest of us yes. who and, were and not quite I, as captivating. If I could add, it is, it is tantalizing and because of the, the breadth word. of this conversation or this contract and all of the many participants, this contract has been under negotiation and review for several months. So having read it several times myself, I can certainly <laughs> endorse it. You need to get a life. Yeah. <laughs> well, if it's got his endorsement, then I'd offer a resolution that oh. <laughs> Absolutely. Yikes. 
<laughs> so yeah, we're just looking for uh, authorization to extend the, the WAPA agreement. Does that contract still have a s slight decline in allotment to us over the course of the contract? It's, it's not a, there is a clause in there. It's not a guaranteed decline. What happens is that every three years, WAPA has to open up 3% of its existing power um, to, and there's requirements. It's basically Native American Indian tribes. And they can come to WAPA and put in requests for this sliver of everybody's allotments that are made available. The last time that they did this, which was just a couple of years ago, um, of the 3%, there was actually only a 1% taking of power. So. They never. They either didn't get enough people to request, or for various reasons, they were not granted the request. And so, it's in there that every three years this will happen, but it's not a guaranteed decrease in in the allotment. But it's still. In yeah, but it's still in there. Yes. I've read that whole contract. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we always like when people are jealous of the city of Fort Morgan. Yes. So. <laughs> there's no questions or comments, I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution accepting and authorizing the mayor to execute a contract number 17-SLC-0846 between the City of Fort Morgan and the Department of Energy Western Area Power Administration for firm electric services. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Christine Castell. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Seven to zero. Yes. Be nice. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for taking one for me. <laughs> Next on the agenda is presentation and possible action on a resolution authorizing additional funding for the old higher police pension plan. Mr. Wells. Thank you. Uh, Mayor and Council. First, I'd like to thank uh, Jeannie, our uh, treasurer, who works very hard to keep up with these uh, issues, financial issues related to our um, unfunded liabilities in the city. Uh, this is an unfunded liability because we basically have an agreement with uh, the three re remaining members of the old higher police pension plan uh, to provide them with a certain percentage of their overall uh, final wage as a pension uh, until their final demise. And so this will continue forward uh, as a responsible, we're, we're, we don't know how long they will live, that's why it's unfunded, just like PARA, just like some of the FPPA programs. Um, as part of the plan, as you can see in the resolution, um, it says that the council can do ad hoc cost of living adjustments and for many years uh, nearly every year uh, the old higher pension uh, group has come in and asked for a cost of living adjustment similar to what is provided in some of the other types of uh, defined benefit plans out there uh, the council approved uh, for last year and we're, and we're requesting this year and what's interesting is for whatever reason, we're always a year behind uh, in, in doing this because it takes them so much time to do the actuarial study, so much time to put everything together. Then we have to get approval from the pension police pension board, bring it to council. Anyway, so we're always a little bit behind. That doesn't make the pensioners very happy, but it's the process we have to go through. We've looked at trying to bring that forward and we can't quite seem to get that coordinated with FPPA. Um, so what we're, uh, what you'll be approving tonight with this resolution is a 2% cost of living adjustment uh, for the benefit of the three remaining members of the old higher pension plan. So uh, did I miss something? Jeannie, come on up. Make sure I didn't miss something. With the fact that we're behind by a year, do we then pay in a lump to the to them or do we pay... FPPA makes those payments and make sure that they catch up if it's in arrears. So, go yeah. Good evening, Council. I just wanted to clarify that this resolution should not be uh, authorizing a two percent. We already did that, but it's always done in in arrears. And so the amount that we need to pay now is without any raise on January first of two thousand eighteen. 
at, we're paying for the raises back for January 1st, 2017, and the one the year before that. Now, this is the year when there will be an actuarial study. So in June, we will hear from FPPA, and they will tell us, um, uh, if you're gonna give this percent, then it's gonna cost this, if you're gonna give this, and then the, the board, they will meet together and decide, but it will always, it will be retroactive. So then we'll already be behind. When we get to July or September, or whenever that's done, we'll have to retro it for them, and then we usually approve it for the two years until another actuarial study. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, that's how but they do it. So I just wanted to clarify that yeah. this, we're not approving a 2% because I certainly wouldn't want the pensioners to think that. They've already gotten the ones they're getting. If they get one in 2018, it won't be awarded until probably August or September or something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jeannie. Are there any questions? <coughs> any concerns? Any Hope we'll get another two year one coming up this year. Yeah, we will. We will. And, you know, a, an interesting concept uh, with the plans is that these defined benefit plans are all trying to figure out how to maintain the unfunded liability and payments. And I think that we have to make sure that we are financially um, sound in the decision making that we have going forward. So, anyways, with that, uh, turn it over to you to make a decision. Any other questions, clarifications, or such? Seeing none, I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution authorizing additional funding for the old higher pension plan in 2018. Second. A resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Christine Castello, vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Next, we have possible action on a first reading of an ordinance 1203, amending the City of Fort Morgan Land Use Code concerning minor subdivisions and request to schedule a public hearing on the ordinance for January 16th. Mr. Wells and Mr. Glamire. Well, I'll let uh, Mr. Glamire kind of walk you through the process of what we're doing, but I wanted to point out that the reason we're here is uh, Steve is doing a really good job in making sure that as we find issues in the code that are not as builder friendly as they need to be, that we're trying to bring those to council and, and fix those as part of the process. We want to make sure that we're able to do things as quickly and efficiently without compromising um, you know, the public's input in these things so that we can get things approved, built, and down the road faster. And so this is just one of those items. And so I turn it over to Steve to kind of explain it. Yep, that's, any questions? No. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jeff, I appreciate that. Yeah, what you have before you tonight really is, is a code change to try to just make the process a little uh, simpler and uh, more efficient for city-owned properties. I had the question, is this for all minor subdivisions or just city-owned property minor subdivisions? And it is just for city-owned property. Uh, it's not uncommon for cities, particularly cities that have most of their utility systems, to have an ability to do minor subdivisions, those subdivisions less than four lots, uh, four lots or less, um, administratively. Really the reason for a public hearing, which is what we currently require in minor subdivisions, is to make sure that all of the interests are held whole and that everybody has an opportunity to comment Typically, the folks that comment the most are the utility companies. Well, we are the utility company here for the most part. So um, what we're looking to do tonight is just streamline the process for uh, city-owned property of minor subdivisions, four lots or less. I have the ability to just uh, approve those administratively, but I also have the ability to take it through the process should we think that Jeff is out of control and we need to put the brakes on, you know, with a uh, piece of property in the city. So, um, <laughs> well, you know that but, could happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> it does allow us that, uh, that flexibility as well, but uh, we think in this instance, uh, in most instances, the city's going to be looking out for their best interest and the best interest of the citizens when we look at these things on our own property. And so uh, that's what we have before you tonight uh, for consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I got two questions. Yeah. Um, first of all, does this create or is this going to cause any conflict with people seeing or believing that there's a double standard? I don't think so. Um, 
certainly we take comment on things pretty regularly anyway. Um, and we try to be as transparent as possible with all the processes that we have. But again, most of the uh, interest that, that you find is, is with the city and, and its utilities and, and roads and infrastructure and those types of things. Um, if I think there's an instance where the public really would have a vested interest and, and want to have a say, that's where I have the flexibility to take it through the process. And, and so I think this gives me the latitude to have that um, ability and, and just be able to discern that. Um, and certainly if I think this is a large enough issue that I would recommend that we just take it through the public hearing process that we currently have in place. An example <clears throat> that might be helpful to illustrate this is, let's say we have a piece of property and we decide we need more water pressure for industrial use and we need to build a water tower. Well, we have to create a lot that the city owns to build the water tower. Well, to create the lot, you've got to go through the subdivision process. And that subdivision process is going to take uh, three to six months, uh, potentially, for us to get that all through the public thing. But the, the issue of the public process is let the public have input on whether or not that is going to affect uh, the area. Well, most people want to have water pressure, and most people aren't going to be upset that we dedicate a piece of land and subdivide it for the improvement of the water infrastructure to help them. I think another example would be you know, more relevant uh, and not so hypothetical is with the uh, center point plaza development we're going to have different companies come in there and make offers on property to say hey i need four acres to do this we haven't gone in and carved it up to say this is what you can buy we've left it open to whatever the different uses might be so a developer might come in and say hey i need six acres over here well okay now we need to go through the subdivision process it's city-owned land um, and are we going to then make that person wait for the three to six months while we go through the process for us to subdivide our land when we've already determined what, re what uh, infrastructure is necessary for roads, water, electric, and gas, and already got it built in there? The subdivision process is really helpful um, for the public's perspective when you have a piece of property like you do south of the middle school that's privately owned. They're going to go in and subdivide it, build lots, and some of that property and infrastructure is going to be turned over back to the city. Well, we want to make sure that the public has input on public improvements to make sure that it's not being done uh, in a way that doesn't benefit the public. We want to make sure that the roads are wide enough. We want to make sure that there's pipelines in there uh, adequate to serve the people over there so that the general public doesn't get stuck with a development from a developer that's under uh, underdeveloped. Is there a better way to say that? No, I think that's... I, I'm sure there is. Jason? Yeah. Um, but anyway, so that maybe I'm hoping that will illustrate kind of what we're doing here. It's just related to if there's a double standard. I, I don't believe it's a double standard. It's actually going to be helpful for developers that want to come in and purchase city-owned property or if the city needs to um, make some adjustments to their property. Okay, so we don't foresee some developers being upset. Well, the city can do whatever they want but I gotta go through this long three month yeah. process. I, I don't think so. I think if we don't do this, we're gonna see some developers frustrated that um, we have a piece of property for them to come and build their business on and they know how much land they need and we're gonna say, well, now we're gonna delay you for three months before you can, I mean, we can close on the land tomorrow, but we can't actually sell it to you until we get the subdivision done in three months. And, and to be fair to your point, when a private developer, somebody looking to subdivide private land comes in, the entire process is set up to make sure that it's done correctly. So there's this comment period back and forth to make sure the final plat and this preliminary plat and all these things are done correctly. Staff reviews those things, provides comments, they fix them. That's what the process is designed for. The thought being when it's publicly owned property that the city owns, we're, we know what we want and expect out of ourselves when we're dividing a property. So we're gonna have that up front. So the ability to shorten that process to meet our own standards. There wouldn't be a comment period between Steve and himself, I guess, is the point. It could be really long. <laughs> <laughs> Some, ask my wife some days. Right. <laughs> but when I've seen you talking are to yourself, it's really pretty short. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen a long it's one. It's not much up there to He's subdividing well. when he does that. <laughs>
No, no, it's a fair question, Dan. And, and again, I, I, I'd make the point that it's not uncommon for cities to have that ability to do that because they do protect their own interest and understand what those interests are and, and can set that aside. So I think a lot of cities, you see this as, as fairly common, and I think developers have just, they realize that that's, that's how it works. It makes sense that that's how it works. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Steve? No, sir. Steve, you had mentioned that utility companies tend to object to this kind of thing? Well, no, what I mean is that typically if, if you don't own all of the utilities within the city, utility companies want the opportunity to review such things in a public hearing or a public manner. So for instance, if we didn't have our own gas utility, uh, Kinder Morgan or, or Black Hills Energy or somebody may want that public hearing opportunity to come in and comment on their infrastructure and how it's being built. In the city of Fort Morgan, we have all the utilities other than communication, and typically those aren't that onerous on the, well, well typically they never comment, but if they do, it's, it's, you know, nothing that's onerous on us or, or the developers. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And, I, and I guess um, to put that into context, most of, when you see CenturyLink or Charter come in and they're putting in fiber, um, in most cases, nearly all cases, they're getting it, they're putting it in the public right away, yeah. publicly owned property uh, for the benefit of the public and that, that's where they would want to come in and comment. Is there going to be enough room in this new subdivision to ensure that they have adequate public space for them to run the utilities without having to come back in and buy property from the individual property owners to make sure that they can get their utilities in there safely and adequately to serve the public interest? Thank you. Good questions. Good yeah, questions. Good. Very good questions. Any other questions? <coughs> Seeing none, I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution on first reading of ordinance number 1203, amending the City of Fort Morgan land use code concerning minor subdivisions and request to schedule a public hearing on the ordinance for January 16th. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrop and a second by Christine Casteau. A vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Steve. Next is public comment and audience participation. Jenny? <laughs> Reports by officials and staff. Oh, we have a few things tonight. Um, <laughs> You've probably noticed that we've had uh, a few water leaks, and I think that's probably what Brent's coming up to talk about. So I'll let him fill you in on what's going on with that. And then I know the chief has uh, some things to talk about. <laughs> so in the water department, we started the year off with a bang. <laughs> um, pretty much all over Facebook and the newspaper and everything else but uh, just so everybody's aware what happened over at the the courthouse and the judicial complex they had some frozen pipes um, that occurred they um, called the on-call water department gentlemen to come over and try to help them isolate their problem they were fearful that they weren't going to be able to get it done within their own building, so we went to shut down a valve for them out in the street. Uh, we um, cracked the valve trying to shut it down on their behalf, had water coming up in the street that turned into eight hours or more, no, closer to 12 hours of trying to fix a valve that was odd sized and we had no replacement parts for and then when we did find something that worked it broke too so it is still <laughs> leaking over there just so everybody's fully aware um, everybody is back in water we did have um, the pressure turned down while we were working on that so we did have pressure complaints from Saturday when you do that in a system it typically breaks the manganese loose in the pipes so then people start getting the little black and brown flakes and so for that we apologize too and and um, so then today we spent most of the day getting the valves back on to where everybody was back and pressurized so they could run business like usual. Uh, we're 
going to have to do some emergency work on that water line. That water line was put in originally, it runs down Beaver all the way out to the industrial park. So it's an odd size line to begin with. It's a, a unique material um, to begin with. And so it's difficult to get parts and work on it anyway. So we will get stuff like that scheduled and done on kind of an emergency basis and hopefully get that back up and going. So. And then if the guys on call didn't have enough excitement over the weekend, approximately, I think it was 6 o'clock on Monday night, somebody missed the corner at Cargill and ran a car right through one of our well houses, um, concrete block well house. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not for sure what shape the car is in, but I've, if I understand right, the gentleman survived the crash, but I don't think our well house um, did. So it's kind of in a heap of trouble over there. So. So yeah, we've we've had an interesting couple of days in the water department to start off the new year. So, but so that's where everything's at. So if you're getting phone calls, we're trying to stay on top of it. We will have to do some type of shutdown again at the judicial complex, but hopefully it's just a short couple hour shutdown while we're changing out a valve, and then they'll be back in water, so they won't have to evacuate the <laughs> residents that live there in the orange jumpsuits. <laughs> so any questions for me on that? Lots of kudos from um, from the county's perspective. There were a lot of kudos that I've heard since being back at work at the job that the city employees did out there. And the, for the record, it was really, really cold. Yes, it was. yes. Wasn't like a balmy, sunny day. It was really cold. And um, lots of kudos for the job that they did and the f speed of which they did it. So I will pass it along, and we'll all prove yeah. easier once we finally get it officially fixed. So <laughs> do we know how long? Um, the road will be blocked? The road will be closed until further notice, until okay. we get the parts in. We're having to let the water just come to the surface during the day, and we go over there with the vac truck and we vac the hole out. And so, yeah, until we get it fixed, we're gonna have to leave that open. We might want to adjust, my, I might suggest we might want to adjust the cones um, working right there. People are yeah. going around the cones on Oh. Right hand side and driving along the edge of the curb. Okay. So they won't get it too far. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can you can get by. Yeah. I mean and it I'll talk with streets again and yeah, have see them adjust. They the, can't maybe yep. block it a little more. Dig the hole a little bit wider. I mean most people are diverting and if they come down there they're coming through the DHS parking lot okay. and going around like they should, but some people of course feel the need yeah. to try to but, squeeze. But you might get another picture to be able to show us like the one you had of the pickup in. True, the, yeah. Was, the yeah. Deal yeah out two years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Well that's almost as good as the picture he has of the person who yeah. added a doorway into the wheelhouse. Yes. So <laughs> thank you, you very much. So, okay. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, thank Brent. You. Keep up the good work. Chief. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council. Uh, as you know, we participated for the first time in National Night Out uh, Tuesday, first Tuesday of August this year. And uh, we received an award, Rookie of the Year. The award has come in, and I wanted to bring it to, to your attention tonight and show you. Uh, um, uh, the reading on the award is a National Night Out 2017 Police Community Partnerships Rookie of the Year Award 2017, recognizing outstanding participation in America's National Night Out Against Crime, presented by the National Association of Town Watch to Fort Morgan, Colorado. And I, I, I think this award uh, shows our progress in community policing, and I think it also is uh, really an award for everybody. Uh, we had 2,000 people uh, at that event, uh, and every member of the police department as well. Uh, we couldn't have done this without um, the cooperation of all the other city departments. Uh, uh, they helped us put this together, and, and I wanted to present this to the mayor. Uh, uh, as our way to show that we did pretty well. Uh, only a handful in the country uh, were recognized as Rookie of the Year, and uh, same number in Colorado. So I think we were, we were one of six in the state uh, to receive this. So I wanted to present this to the mayor, and then uh, I want to take it back because we want to hang it at the police station. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Put it in that train. Okay, you right. got to wait for Jenny. Wait Thank for Jenny. Wait for Jenny. Oh. Wait for Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> wait for Jenny. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Just a reminder to all of council, next week is a special meeting for reorganization of the city council. 
Uh, and right after that, uh, you probably got uh, some invitations for a transition uh, dinner after the meeting and look forward to seeing everybody there. The, uh, Jeff, yes. along, that, along that lines, I, I wanted to apologize to everyone on council and staff and, and, the, and the residents. I will not be in attendance at that meeting. Uh, um, I've started a new, uh, a new job and, and I've been scheduled to work that night, so I, I apologize. Yeah. We'll miss you. We'll send Carissa to dinner. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have to come, just anyway. <laughs> um, the other thing uh, you may have seen uh, is a really nice uh, article written uh, by Jason Myers in one of the recent uh, CML publications. Was that the Colorado Cities and Towns? Colorado Municipalities Magazine. Municipalities Magazine. Very nice. Very well done. So if you didn't get a chance to read that, uh, take a minute and read up on our own city attorney. Good job, Jason. He's famous. Um, one other thing, I, I, it's, it hasn't happened yet, but I'm pretty sure that it will. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about how uh, lucky we are to have some of the employees that we do have at the city of Fort Morgan. Uh, in just about two weeks, our own, uh, maybe just one week, Chandra McCoy at the library, who is our uh, library and museum director, uh, will finish her second master's degree that she's been working on in library science. Um, when she started at the city of Fort Morgan, she had a master's degree that assisted her in the education role uh, in the um, in the uh, museum. And then she stepped up, <clears throat> took over the library aspect of management over there, and decided she was going to further education to make sure she was doing that right, and on her own has gone out and finished up that uh, second degree. We're very proud of her and her accomplishments. and. Again, I think uh, it's a testament to the dedication of our employees and our managers here at the City of Fort Morgan to make sure that we are the best employees that we can be. And I want to thank her and congratulate her on that uh, milestone in her career that helps all of us. So I wanted to bring that up tonight. So we'll clap for her, even though it's the end of the day. Um, and I think that's all that I have, unless you have any questions. All right. Bids, meetings, and announcements. Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, city is accepting sealed bids for a sewer inspection camera system and transport van until 2.45 p.m. on January 11th, and sealed bids for two police patrol vehicles until 3 p.m. on January 25th. Under meetings, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, Senior Center Advisory Board will meet January 9th at 1.30 p.m. at the Senior Center. The City Council special meeting, the organizational meeting will be that same day, January 9th at 6 p.m. here at City Hall. Uh, the Airport Advisory Board is scheduled to meet on January 10th at noon at the airport. And then on Monday, January 15th, all city offices will be closed for Martin Luther King Day. And then January 16th will be the next uh, regular City Council meeting at 6 p.m. here. Anything else to come before this council? No, sir. Saying none. Meetings adjourned. We so rarely get to do that. <laughs> I don't get to do it.